Okay, and okay. So, uh, first of all, good uh, morning, uh, good uh, afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are uh, in the world. Uh, we've been very lucky today to have a uh, a global audience. Uh, so, uh, we'll try to uh, make it quick uh, for those of you that are least this uh, overseas. Uh, my name is uh, Matthias uh, Carlson. Uh, and I'll be taking you through essentially a quick presentation uh, today uh, called uh, a numerical RTA in Witson Plus, uh, and also a demonstration of uh, the implementation of this uh, methodology within uh, Witson Plus. Uh, the uh, the first thing that you see on the screen here is uh, is uh, also probably a little bit of a provoking statement. Uh, is this the future of uh, production data analysis and unconventionals? Um, uh, I guess time will will show, but I'm uh, pretty excited about the very very good adoption and good uh, start of this uh, this type of methodology that was originally proposed by uh, by Braden Bowie and James Ewart at uh, Urtech. Uh, last uh, year. Uh, before we start, just a few meeting uh, logistics. Uh, so we have more than 100 uh, participants uh, today, uh, and we are using a system called uh, WebEx uh, Events, uh, which mutes everybody by uh, default. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't uh, ask uh, questions. There is a Q&A box uh, to uh, the right uh, that you can use uh, throughout the presentation, and we'll have a Q&A session uh, in uh, the end, I uh, just want to remind everybody that uh, the court or the uh, the uh, webinar will be uh, recorded, uh, just as we record all of our other webinars. Uh, the next webinar is, that's coming up uh, is already next uh, month uh, on gas concept PVT. What's really important and uh, why? With uh, Curtis, which is also here with us uh, today. Uh, Evan Fevong and uh, Tao Young and all the, the registration for uh, future webinars uh, and also the uh, legacy recordings of our previous webinars can be found on witson.com slash training. Um, just provide a little bit of context for today's uh, session. Uh, for those of you who have been following our uh, previous uh, webinar sessions, uh, know that we had a session with uh, Steve Jones uh, in February. Uh, last month, we had a, a session with uh, with uh, Braden Bowie that actually had, uh, and we, we kind of talked about a few of the concepts that also uh, Steve Steve mentioned in his webinar, uh, but just kind of through that framework that uh, Braden talked about uh, in the last uh, webinar, which we abbreviated to be uh, numerical RJ and, and Titan conventionals. And uh, in this call, we'll essentially go through how we have uh, in practice uh, implemented this into Witson Plus, which is our uh, online uh, software uh, platform. Uh, and to provide a little bit of context of uh, kind of how this whole uh, implementation got started. Uh, so so uh, Braden and James Hewitt, they wrote a paper for Urtec last uh, year. Uh, I think there were some technical uh, issues when they presented. So I don't know how many people actually uh, we're aware of the paper at Urtec, uh, but uh, uh, we at least uh, got it, uh, or I got it uh, forwarded to me, uh, I think it was early December as of last uh, year. Uh, uh, I read it uh, a few times and I thought it was brilliant. I think uh, one of the first things I did was to send it to Curtis. Uh, he also thought it was uh, uh, brilliant and we uh, decided to to go ahead and actually get it implemented in uh, in Witson Plus, and we had the first, uh, uh, call it a prototype of the version, uh, already up in, in a couple of weeks, uh, such that we could start uh, testing and, and whatnot. And we've been able to improve upon that methodology of the user friendliness of the, the implementation, et cetera, through, uh, uh, through feedback from, for instance, Braden and multiple of the other operators that are as actual uh, use, uh, using Witson Plus in their, in their day to day uh, work. Uh, what I think is important to communicate is that uh, Witson Plus is not only a platform that can only do numerical uh, RTA. We're trying to make it a platform that can do everything from uh, from A to C. So to create uh, very detailed detailed PVT information from equation state models, perform uh, uh, pipe flow calculations or BHP calculations uh, where that is needed if you don't have measured uh, data. 
uh, to do, for instance, uh, numerical RTA that we'll talk about uh, today. Um, and uh, of course, tie this with the pool physics, uh, numerical reservoir simulation and uh, forecasting. Um, and uh, as was also mentioned in, I think, uh, Braden's uh, original paper is that we'll, we'll like to try to be able to do this uh, on every single well in, in, in less than 10 minutes. So not taking any technical shortcuts, but you have to have it kind of streamlined in a seamless manner to be able to utilize that uh, efficiently. And it all kind of goes, uh, boils down to uh, this quote right here that it's, uh, uh, at least in, in my personal opinion, better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. So instead of doing uh, very, very, very detailed analysis and studies uh, on just a pad over one year or two year uh, studies, uh, we rather look at the hundreds or thousands of wells that are in the basin with this type of uh, analysis. And to just boil it down before we go into the weeds, just look at a little bit of this uh, from a holistic uh, point of view. Uh, what we're going to talk about is what we call numerical RTA. Why is it called the numerical RTA? Well, it's just because we're combining kind of fundamental RTA concepts from kind of the analytical RTA uh, world with full physics numerical reservoir simulation models. Um, and uh, for at least many of us, that's kind of been like pineapples and, and uh, pizzas. Um, you know, we, most of us enjoy them separately, but only a few of us can actually handle the mix um, until this paper from, from Braden uh, and, uh, and James uh, last uh, year that, at least in, in my opinion, I think also for uh, a lot of people, kind of created a bridge between uh, these two uh, silos or these two, uh, these two worlds. Before going into the workflow as such, the implementation into Witson Plus, uh, et cetera, I thought I could just uh, recap a few things that Braden talked about in his last uh, webinar, which is, okay, you know, okay, this is fine that we do this type of analysis, but why do we actually do it uh, in the first place? Um, and uh, as he mentioned, and how I think they're using it internally in Apache is, is to uh, basically try to tie uh, uh, the overall analysis to, to economics, to uh, economically optimize uh, uh, development, essentially, it, it being well spacing, frac design, et cetera. Uh, and to do that uh, the, uh, through this workflow, uh, we, we will be talking about and also characterizing a, a early time deliverability term that uh, Braden uh, uh, and a lot of other people in the industry knows uh, as uh, LFP, so the A squared of K term, uh, and also uh, the drainage volume, how much uh, of, uh, of uh, the oil in place or hydrocarbons in place are we actually uh, contacting. Uh, and, and Braden showed some uh, very cool examples in his uh, webinar where they've essentially done this analysis on every single well, then they've aggregated this type of analysis up to a pad level such that they could uh, ultimately compare uh, pad to pad or lease to lease. Uh, and uh, as he also mentioned, ultimately tie that to economics such that uh, they can come up with recommendations going forward, no matter what your financial KPI might be whether that's uh, an NPV or, or profitability index uh, or or something else. Um, so that's the overall goal, and uh, this is uh, this is one tool in that uh, toolkit would be to use this uh, numerical RTA workflow that will go through one more time uh, today. Uh, I'll just to try to explain it uh, uh, at least the way we've implemented it into the tool and how. At least I understand it uh, uh, myself, and then we'll go over to a to a demo. Uh, the first thing to just note uh, for all the things that we'll discuss in the slides uh, today, um, and all the kind of key takeaways and conclusions, uh, they build upon uh, a key assumption, which is this uh, symmetry of element uh, model that you see here, which for many of us, so it's a so-called uh, 1D model. So uh, there's only one no-flow boundary, uh, which in this case is between uh, the fracks. So there's uh, included no volume beyond the uh, tip of the frac, uh, et cetera. Um, and that's just to make sure that we have uh, our basics right before we show some of the results in theory. Uh, however, a lot of the concepts apply also to more complex uh, geometries, but uh, we need to start with what's uh, simple and build upon uh, from, uh, from there. Um, the second thing to just uh, remind everybody of, and I'm 100% I'm sure uh, most of you know this uh, already, but this is uh, 
uh, one of uh, my good friends, Dave uh, Anderson, showing kind of the industry standard uh, workflow when it comes to analytical RTA uh, in one of the, the courses at, uh, at uh, Saga Wisdom. Um, where he uh, essentially is coupling this, uh, what uh, they call the specialized plot or the square root of time plot uh, to get an estimate of the uh, LFP together with the flowing material balance exercise to get the estimate of OIP. And we'll, we'll in the end of this uh, presentation, actually see that uh, those fundamental concepts is what we're trying to do also in the numerical RTA uh, workflow. Um, and just to go back to a few of the basics uh, that I thought was laid out excellently in that uh, paper by uh, James and uh, or Braden and uh, James in the first place. Um, and I think it makes sense that we go through a few of those basics before uh, we jump into the actual workflow um, is to uh, look at why do we actually think uh, it could be good to actually couple a full physics numerical simulator to uh, an RTA workflow. Um, what we see on the screen in front of us is uh, kind of the uh, 101 of the so-called square root of time uh, plot, where we know when we're dealing with single phase flow above the saturation and pressure above the bubble point in this case, could be constant rate for that matter. On the square root of uh, time plot, we get uh, a uh, uh, straight line behavior as long as we are in infinite acting uh, linear flow. And from this, we can uh, plug in our PVT uh, properties, uh, the rock compressibility term, and we can also uh, resolve a uh, linear flow uh, parameter. Um, what uh, Braden and a lot of other authors as well have uh, communicated many times before, and you can just run a numerical simulator and you'll convince yourself that that's the case, is that when we start to introduce changing rates and pressures, we, we, uh, we tend to also get uh, not only one slope, but multiple slopes, even though we are in uh, an infinite acting type of environment. Uh, which uh, can complicate the exercise. And I don't know how many times, at least I've been sitting together with our clients here in North America, and we've been looking at this uh, plot that we've been scratching our head and asking, which of the slopes should we actually pick? And you know that's typically corresponding to changes in choke sizes, et cetera, uh, which makes this, uh, this exercise, at least in, in many cases, uh, quite difficult. And, and uh, you will typically get different answers if you ask 10 different engineers. Uh, but in my world, and uh, I think at least internally at uh, Whitson, probably the biggest uh, reason for introducing a full physics uh, uh, numerical simulator together with uh, RTA is not only the superposition effects uh, alone, because this is single phase uh, flow stuff, so that's fairly simple. Uh, but it's uh, uh, the uh, the biggest advantage is the combination of multi-phase flow effects and superposition effects uh, at the same time uh, that can be handled very accurately by these uh, full physics uh, reservoir simulators if you've assigned a proper fluid incisation, et cetera. Uh, to exemplify a little bit of the problem with the square root of time plot, um, if you are dealing with a situation that you're typically dealing with in tight time conventionals, uh, where you have a rapidly declining bottom hole pressure, then it kind of stabilizes at some minimum bottom hole uh, pressure, um, is that when you're going below the saturation pressure, you're getting these uh, these uh, large changes in compressibility. Um, and if we look at these two drawdown profiles, the exact same uh, well, uh, which is a synthetic example, so we know that it, this should be infinite acting for the entirety of uh, history. Uh, and if the square root time plot uh, kind of analysis would be, uh, uh, or, or theory would be correct, we would expect a straight line behavior for the entirety of, uh, of uh, uh, produced time. Uh, but in this case, we actually see that uh, just depending on our drawdown profile, we'll get the deviation from the straight, straight line behavior as we go uh, to phase, so we drop below the saturation pressure. And uh, as communicated by, by many uh, people, if you misinterpret this to be, uh, for instance, boundary effects, or the misinterpret this to be uh, you know, reaching time to end a linear uh, flow. Uh, this typically leads to a conclusion of uh, higher permeabilities, short, shorter fracture half lengths that justifies more wells per section. And that at least for, for many of us has been, been one of the reasons for uh, an overcapitalization that we've been seeing in the industry uh, for, uh, for a few, uh, few years now. And at least that's been a topic within the industry in the last, uh, last uh, four or five uh, years. Um, and, uh, 
the quote unquote solution to uh, to at least this uh, particular issue and, and a more consistent way of at least picking LFPs is what we call uh, the Bowie workflow. Um, and I know what all of you are thinking. You think that David Bowie um, invented this workflow. No, that's not the case. Uh, it has nothing to do with uh, David Bowie or here in Texas, we, we know James Bowie and the Bowie knife uh, very well. Uh, but it's actually just after uh, Braden Bowie and his paper that you can find uh, at, uh, from from this uh, link that was uh, presented at Ruchek uh, last uh, year. Um, the last uh, four or five uh, months when we've been working with this uh, uh, workflow, we've been lucky to interact with uh, Braden and also others that provide very good insights uh, in terms of the uh, the uh, workflow. So we've been able to extend the, the workflow uh, a little bit. Uh, the first thing was, uh, which was uh, fairly, uh, fairly trivial to do, was to generalize the workflow to all fluid systems and not only uh, oil systems by introducing a so-called uh, total oil formation volume factor term. Um, Braden also had some very good thoughts of how you could use the workflow for uh, finite conductivity fractures. Uh, so uh, that has also been uh, implemented. So low, uh, essentially that you can allow for low FCD uh, situations. Um, we introduced a so-called cumulative LFP term, and we'll talk about that in a second, just uh, uh, especially nice when you work with real data to, to reduce a little bit of uh, noise. Uh, very, very simple to implement in, in general. Um, and uh, we also uh, actually introduced uh, or included the square root of uh, porosity term in the LFP definition, and we'll talk about why uh, that was the case. Uh, and uh, there's also other things, and we'll we'll try to summarize that uh, in a paper that we'll present at ATC uh, later this uh, year. Uh, I guess the the most important thing to emphasize here is that the workflow is fairly new. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, very exciting things uh, with regards to the workflow, uh, and there's always uh, almost every every single month there's several good new ideas of how. Uh, things can be done a little bit differently, or we're testing different uh, cases that hasn't been tested before, uh, et cetera. So I think we're we're kind of still in our infancy when it comes to this uh, workflow, and it uh, is uh, very positive to see also how it is adopted, uh, at least among the people that that I to talk to. So to go back to uh, kind of the paper and, and what is the key part uh, in the paper, the way uh, I uh, read it, uh, then uh, it can be cool if Braden uh, would, would disagree or, or agree. Um, but in the paper, and at least a big eye opener for, for uh, myself, uh, is uh, how he uh, ties these two definitions. So the linear flow parameter and uh, uh, OYP to three fundamental well-performance uh, conclusion or, um, conclusions or observations. Um, as I mentioned, we've introduced, uh, call it a modified LFP term. There's nothing more magical uh, about this than introducing the square root of porosity, and we'll explain uh, why a little bit uh, later. Uh, except for that, everything else is the same. And these three uh, fundamental relationships uh, is that for any two wells, uh, with the same LFP square root of porosity product, then the rate performance will be identical during infinite acting behavior. Um, for any two wells with the same ratio of LFP square root of porosity and OYP, the relative rates, so the GURs and water cut, will be identical for all times, both infinite acting and boundary dominated or transitional flow. Um, the uh, uh, last thing is for any two wells with the same LFP and OIP numbers, the rate performance will be identical for all times, both infinite acting and boundary dominated. Okay, uh, and it's important to remember here that uh, the assumptions is that uh, the two wells needs to have the same fluid initialization, so that's PVT and initial water saturation, and relative permeability uh, relationships, uh, and also be controlled on the same bottom hole flowing pressure over time. And then a question that comes up many times is, okay, what two wells has all of those things in common? Well, uh, you, you should be very lucky if that's the case. But the nice thing is, and the brilliant thing about this is that we're applying these relationships, not to two different wells, but to the same well. And for a given well, there is one fluid insulation that makes sense. There is a set of rel term sets that makes sense. And it's also, 
uh, one bottom hole pressure uh, drawdown profile versus time. Uh, of these are probably the relative terms uh, the most uh, uh, uncertain, uh, or there are uncertainties in all these inputs. But uh, but at least for a given well, uh, there should be one uh, input for all of these uh, different parameters. Just remind ourselves that these uh, things are uh, true in general. I would go and just create a uh, a model to convince yourself. That's what. Uh, uh, at least we did, um, and here we see a case one where you know you make three different cases where the product of LFP square root of porosity is the same. Then the uh, performance during infinite acting behavior is identical. Uh, here you can also see the reason for including square root of porosity. Uh, it's uh, because uh, here we see the LFPs are actually different, but uh, the total deliverability uh, is uh, needs to account for the square root of uh, porosity such that uh, all the total rates during this period of time is uh, exactly the same. Uh, the other thing is uh, if the ratio uh, is the same, as we see down to the right here, all the relative rates are the same. So that's GORs and water cuts. Uh, I'm not showing water cut here because of lack of space. But what you can also see is that all the total rates, both infinite acting and boundary dominated in this case, uh, is just a, a multiplier of each other. Um, and then the last uh, case is, of course, if you multiply all these um, these to the same uh, OIP and LFP uh, numbers, and then, of course, the ratio is also the same, then all the relative rates are identical and also all the total rates are identical. Um, and these three fundamental relationships, at least from my perspective, was uh, I don't know if I knew it before I read the paper, but when I read it, I thought this is brilliant. Uh, and uh, I've heard many people say uh, the same, and they in many ways provide the basis for the entire uh, workflow and, and provides the, call it the elegant parts of the, of the workflow. So to go through the workflow a little bit uh, step by step uh, in eight steps uh, and with a few cartoons, uh, this is essentially how you would go ahead and implement the method in, uh, by yourself. Uh, I've tried to make some simplified slides to explain that. Uh, how successful I am at that, uh, we'll see, but uh, at least I'll, I'll make it a try. So it's uh, eight steps at least uh, here that we'll go through that makes the workflow. Uh, but then uh, we have uh, we have uh, automated all these steps in, in the software and I'll show you that uh, in a second. But uh, the first step, which is an important step, is to create the numerical model that's large enough to behave uh, infinite acting uh, for the entirety of historical time when you control it on uh, the well's actual measured bottom hole pressure. Uh, and the simplest way to do that is to create a very simple reservoir model, a so-called symmetry of element uh, model, with a large distance to the closest boundary, so a large OIP. Um, and then, uh, since you are making this model, you, you can assign whatever LFP squared or porosity that you like to the model. You just only need to make sure that you're not seeing any boundary effects. Okay. Um, the second step would be to run this model on the well's actual measured bottom hole pressure versus time. And that will allow you to get some simulated rates uh, versus time that uh, should be behaving infinite acting because there's no boundary effects in this, uh, in this case. Then you calculate the ratio between the actual uh, production data and these modeled rates, uh, and you get a ratio over time. Alternatively here, to reduce noise, as I talked about earlier, you can use the cumulatives to calculate this ratio, keeping everything else the same. Then you multiply this ratio with the defined LFP square root of porosity that you defined in step uh, one, and you get what we call the Bowie diagnostic uh, plot which is uh, changing over time. It's kind of the quantifying the LFP on a daily basis uh, over time and see how that uh, is uh, changing. And uh, the way to interpret this uh, plot is that a flat horizontal line indicates uh, infinite acting linear flow and deviation below this line represents boundary dominated slash uh, transitional flow, depending on what uh, geometries you're assuming. Uh, and the magnitude of the flat line indicates the uh, LFP squared or porosity for your given uh, well. And then the last part sheet that you need to, uh, to go through uh, would be to uh, do step one and two for multiple, just smaller tank sizes, if you like. Uh, and that will create a wide range of type curves that each is associated with its LFP OIP ratio. 
you then go in and look at your actual production data. You pick an LFP number uh, and uh, you overlay the type curves, and then you pick the OIP stem that is closest to your actual data. And we'll look at this in practice in a second. So as an engineer, you're doing two things. You're picking an LFP and you're picking an OIP, and that's it. And uh, if we go back to see, you know, how will we actually do this in practice? Of course, you need to define your inputs. That's your PBTs and rel perms. Uh, then you need to do the interpretations. You need to pick an LFP and OIP. And actually, many people stop here and they say, I don't know how many fractures I have. I don't know how tall my reservoir are, uh, et cetera, et cetera, or what my process is. So I'll, I'll just stop at this point uh, and I'll use the LFP and OIP aggregate it up to a pad level and look at uh, correlations in completion practices, cluster spacing, well spacing, et cetera, et cetera, throughout the play, just using those parameters. Uh, some people, they like to go one step uh, further where they can define not only, uh, or these inputs like the uh, well length, uh, the height of the reservoir, number of fractures, et cetera, to resolve some estimates for XF and uh, K. And this workflow is what we call the numerical RTA workflow in uh, Witson Plus that you can uh, use uh, uh, on a one to one basis uh, to uh, pull physics numerical reservoir simulation also inside of, um, of the tool. So just to connect uh, the dots a little bit for those of you who've been uh, used to to uh, to doing the workflow we see here uh, with uh, Dave and, and this course, by the way, is extremely uh, enjoyable and I would recommend that that's both with Dave Anderson and uh, Hamid uh, Bemanesh, and uh, uh, you can you can find that course uh, here on on Cyber Wisdom. But for those of you who are, uh, uh, I guess, exposed to this workflow from before, the square root of time plot essentially gives you the LFP square root of porosity, and this form material balance exercise gives you an es estimates of uh, OIP. Uh, and again, here we also see another reasons for including LFP square root of porosity because all these other parameters that we see on the screen here, information volume factor, viscosity, and the total compressibility for all practical purposes, they are uh, PBT uh, properties. If we if we just ignore the rock compressibility term in, in CT, uh, and, uh, and uh, these other parameters is essentially what makes up uh, LFP. So uh, that's another way to, to, uh, to look at that. Uh, a thing that I uh, haven't mentioned, but uh, that we're very excited about is that, you know, this is uh, still a, a method in its in infancy. So there are, you know, future items to be worked on, to be investigated, to be researched. And we by no means have all the answers. Uh, and uh, uh, hopefully we can strive at least to get to a point where we get more and more answers. Uh, the uh, I think immediate future work, at least that I've seen uh, from uh, from uh, my perspective, that would be nice to consistently add into the workflow would be uh, a way to consistently deal with the uh, injected uh, water uh, to also handle the uncertainty in relative permeability uh, across multiple wells in a region. Uh, you know, relative permeability and data for relative permeability is probably what we have the least of. And so at least uh, compared to PVT and water saturations and bottom of pressure, uh, which is the other inputs, uh, probably the biggest uncertainty in, uh, at least in my, uh, my world. Um, we could extend the workflow into other, looking at other geometries, looking at more complex geometries, like an enhanced fracture region model, look at layering, look at differential depletion due to different fluids in different layers, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of exciting things uh, there. There's definitely numerical aspects of the uh, workflow that can make, uh, uh, that should be established because you have to pick kind of like a template model that you're running in the background uh, when you actually do this in practice and uh, how to actually do that to avoid uh, convergence issues in, in most, most of the cases, et cetera. That is uh, maybe an aspect that requires a little bit of uh, work. And of course, making the, um, the uh, method overall more uh, seamless and, and fast or make it as fast and seamless as uh, possible. And there's probably a lot more that uh, I haven't mentioned, but I think in the end of the day, what's important to just emphasize is that, uh, you know, this is super exciting uh, stuff and uh, we're just in the beginning of it. Uh, so if people out there have good thoughts, good ideas of how to deal with this or something else, other concerns that they have, 
I think uh, the technical community uh, and, uh, you know, especially Braden, everybody at Whitson and everybody else that's excited about this workflow uh, are uh, open to take, uh, take any suggestions. The last thing I want to go through, I see we have around 25 minutes uh, left, so that should be more than enough to just go through a quick, uh, quick demo of this in Whitson Plus. Uh, Whitson Plus has a lot of features and uh, will be way too much to cover all of it in one uh, webinar, so I'll only focus on the numerical RTA uh, aspect uh, uh, today and we'll look at the one synthetic uh, data case such that we get a little bit warm and fussy. We like to to look at some some uh, some uh, clean data where everything is perfect, and then we'll look at a real data case with field data, and then we'll look at a field data case with a low uh, where a low FCD assumption have been applied uh, to uh, as an input to the analysis. Uh, so on that note, I'll just uh, stop sharing, and uh, now I hope everybody is seeing a uh, some kind of uh, beach. This is changing every single day, so this is just my starting. A point um, uh, on Google, I guess. Uh, and uh, the reason why I'm showing this is that Whitson Plus is a web based uh, platform uh, uh, that uh, does a lot of calculations in the cloud. Uh, there's a many reasons why we decided to go for a web based uh, solution. Uh, first of all, it makes it very easy for us to uh, be able to implement features, provide updates, fix bugs very, very quickly, such that if you you know, if you have the, the alternative being a desktop application and you have to wait until the next, you know, the uh, three months until the next release is coming or the next six months and you have to download it onto your computer, etc. That problem you don't have with anything that's web based. Uh, when a bug is, uh, for instance, uh, found, we can fix it and hopefully get back to you as uh, soon as uh, possible. So that's been very, very positive and allow for very quick uh, implementation speeds. Uh, the second thing is that you can uh, use, uh, uh, you know, the benefits of the cloud uh, in a very efficient manner. I think this is a great example where the Bowie workflow requires you to run a wide range of numerical full physics numerical reservoir simulation models in parallel, uh, and that's enabled uh, by the cloud, just to spin them up as many as you, uh, as you need. Uh, the other thing is the collaborative aspect uh, that everybody's kind of working on the same, uh, call it uh, data set and in the same, uh, uh, in the same uh, solution that we really uh, seem being very nice. And the last thing is, of course, uh, onboarding that there's nothing to download locally on your computer. The only thing you need to do is to go into your domain you know, let's say that's uh, dev.witson.com, which we'll look at in this case. You click enter, you go into that, and uh, you should be good uh, to go. Uh, what we see here is, uh, first of all, the synthetic uh, case that I'll go through first. Uh, everything that we'll talk about today is in this, uh, um, yeah, is in this uh, menu right here uh, called uh, production data analysis. I think that's a good word that kind of groups everything that we uh, do. So uh, abbreviated PDA. Uh, here we can, of course, calculate bottom wall pressures. You can do the full physics numerical simulation and history matching and forecasting, etc. But we'll just be focusing on this uh, numerical RTA piece right, uh, right here. Uh, the numerical RTA piece is a three-step step process. Uh, we're now in step number two. Uh, we'll uh, leave the leave the fluid and route perm uh, to the to the last uh, real case that I go through, uh, and uh, in step number two, that's really where most of the steps that we went through in the presentation are actually uh, done. Uh, the first thing that I can just uh, show is that the, on the plot in front of us right uh, here, we have uh, uh, what's named actual production uh, data on the Bowie diagnostic uh, plot. That's essentially everything from step one to step four in the PowerPoint slides that I just uh, showed generating this over time. This type of data, that's the actual production data just converted into uh, kind of linear flow parameters every single uh, day. So these curves in all the different diagnostic plots, they won't change at all, uh, so they're fixed. Uh, and then we run all these different uh, geometries uh, in uh, parallel. That's all the other type curves that we see on the plot that uh, is enabled uh, right uh, here. And they actually move up and down depending on what LFP you're picking. So let's say I picked an LFP that's 50,000. That moves all my type curves uh, down. 
and it also updates the associated OIP numbers. And vice versa, if I pick something that's a little bit too uh, too aggressive, and uh, LFP of uh, of uh, 150,000, for instance, we see that all the type curves in this plot is uh, above the actual data. Uh, and we can also see that in a lot of the other uh, plots as well, uh, if our match is, is good or, or bad. Um, and that's uh, also here with square root of time plot, et cetera. So what this menu provides you is just an overview of all the diagnostic plots that we've implemented uh, to date. Maybe not the final number of uh, diagnostic plots. Maybe there are other things we should look at as uh, uh, well. But the, what we have is the key diagnostic plot, which is this Bowie diagnostic plot at uh, the top. And as an engineer, when I get to this uh, step, I need to do two things. I need to pick the LFP square root porosity and an OIP number. Uh, so the, I'll start with the first one. I'll pick an LFP number. Uh, here I know what the answer is, uh, which gives me a lot of confidence when uh, I'm showing this to, to all of you. And I see that the actual production data is very well uh, aligned with uh, the type curve uh, below uh, here. Uh, I see that that, um, uh, that type curve has an associated OIP of 3337. So if I click this type curve with just a simple, uh, I guess, left click, you'll see that that number is automatically updated up here. And the ratio is also calculated automatically. And if I want to be fancy and I want to, for instance, remove a few of my type curves in all the different plots, I can hold in Alt and click the stems and all of those stems will be removed in all the different plots at the same time. So that's synchronized. If I want to do the opposite of only picking the stem that's closest to my actual data, I can hold in Control and click the stem that's actually behind the actual production data right now. A little bit hard to see. Uh, and only keep that one in all the different plots. You see it actually over here that it's uh, type curve below there. And uh, in this case, we're dealing with a perfect uh, match. So that, uh, that uh, makes us feel good. At least if we can do that with synthetic data. The last uh, step uh, is what I said, uh, where some people stop. They say, I picked an LFP and I picked an OIP. I don't want to go any further. Uh, some people like to go further. So they uh, can, for instance, input a matrix porosity right here, you know, that can be 5%, uh, for instance, uh, the reservoir height, the well lateral length, and the number of fractures. And if you change these parameters, the calculated output, so the matrix permeability and fracture half length, et cetera, they're calculated uh, uh, at the same time. So if I make this 10,000, it's calculated again. If I make this 100, it's calculated again, uh, and et cetera. And uh, once I've done this, either I can just save these, this analysis, or I can actually decide to bring these parameters into the full physics reservoir simulation. Uh, and that is done by clicking this use in history matching part right here. That's a kind of a one-way street to bringing all the analysis into your history matching uh, part. And by clicking yes, the reservoir properties uh, uh, result from the numerical RTA workflow will overwrite the existing data in history matching module for this particular well, which again is also run with the full physics numerical reservoir simulation model. And in this case, we see that our results are exact because we're dealing with uh, synthetic uh, data. So let's go over to something a little bit more uh, fun. Uh, this is a case uh, with the real data. Uh, and here, this is uh, on, on purpose picked a case with very bad data. So that we try to be as honest as we uh, can. Uh, here you actually see another thing that I mentioned. We introduced this concept of cumulative LFP. So you can toggle this button if you want to use cumulative or instantaneous LFP. The reason why we introduced cumulative LFPs, uh, which is, uh, again, just to remind everybody what uh, was the only difference between those two uh, uh, numbers, just to show that again real quick, uh, would be to just look at this uh, slide right here, where instead of using the actual rates for a day to calculate the ratio, we use the cumulatives to calculate that ratio, only difference. And the reason for that is that in some cases, when you have a lot of noise, there might be some data that you're missing. In this case, for instance, we didn't have uh, any information to be able to calculate bottom of pressures uh, the last uh, days uh, or, or from 450 days and out. So we just had to apply an assumption of it being constant, which is not correct, but it's uh, better than uh, better than nothing. 
Um, so in this case, we saw, okay, it's maybe a little bit hard to uh, interpret the instantaneous LP, even if we apply like a moving average type of number, uh, maybe can we uh, come up with uh, a way to remove some of that noise? So that's why we introduced this cumulative LP. Uh, but working with uh, real data, all the things uh, still apply. Uh, I need to pick an LFP. Uh, I see that 60,000 is too much, uh, maybe 20,000. That would be, be way too little. Uh, so maybe there's something in between here uh, that uh, would make sense. Uh, and we can uh, see if, uh, uh, yeah. So this makes a little, little bit, a little, uh, at least a little bit more sense, at least if we look, uh, look uh, late time. Uh, you know, we see some of the complexities of working with real data that we can get crossing between some of the stems, etc. But if we look at this stem right here, it's uh, 1650 uh, in OIP. Here, we're dealing with 1650 in OIP for the cumulatives. And uh, here, it's pretty tight in terms of the other stems here, but we see 16.5 is also a good, uh, good number right here. So what I can do is to click this number, it transports up uh, here. Uh, and I can, if I want to be fancy, also decide to just keep that, uh, not that stem, that was uh, the wrong uh, number. I wanted to keep keep that stem um, and then uh, bring these parameters into uh, the last step, do exactly what I did earlier and decide whether I would like to use these in, in history matching uh, or uh, not. Uh, in this case, I would like to do that. And in this case uh, as well, uh, here again, we've ignored Water, but on the first run to get this kind of match with so little effort uh, here on all these diagnostic plots, doing a pretty okay uh, job, I would say, on GORs and OGRs and everything. Uh, I think we should be uh, be uh, again very uh, uh, very happy, at, especially with so little effort that we've uh, used to to generate the, this type of good uh, good match. And uh, hopefully that can also uh, some people in the audience uh, hopefully uh, recognizes uh, some of the frustration that. Uh, can come with a lot of history matching at work. Uh, in the last example, I'll just show a low FCD example. Uh, so a case where we, in the workflow, just consistently uh, also defined a, fine, uh, a uh, FCD that's low enough to behave uh, as a finite connectivity uh, type of fracture, uh, which for all practical purposes is just an additional pressure drop from the reservoir to the well bore and what actually causes that uh, and the need for including that in reality. There's multiple different reasons for that. Uh, but in the first step, you need to be able to, to uh, define your fluid incisation. So typically that's in terms of uh, GOR behind the scenes here. There's a like, fully beautiful extrapolated uh, black oil table um, that's generated from an equation of state. Uh, and the only thing you as a user needs to input is an additional initial, uh, initial GOR. Uh, of course, the reservoir inputs and, and the uh, water saturation. Uh, you need to also provide some matrix relative permeability uh, curves. Um, and then uh, you can, before you actually go in and run this case, uh, make sure that you get some consistent uh, uh, water cuts and, and uh, GORs before you apply the workflow by, uh, uh, by uh, Braden. And in this case, we actually see uh, there's something that looks like it is still uh, infinite acting, uh, the LFP is uh, more or less uh, more or less flat. And this is another example where we have very good production data on the other end. So uh, another extreme in, in terms of data quality, but here both the instantaneous LFP plot, the cumulative plot are kind of giving us the same uh, conclusions. Uh, here we picked uh, 45 uh, uh, in LFP and the OIP of uh, this stem right here is just picked uh, again from this uh, curve. We can bring these parameters into uh, history matching, do exactly, I don't know anything about this well in terms of uh, parameters, so I just put in something. And when we click use these parameters into history matching, there's an additional info box that has come up. That's that FCD will consistently be converted to the history matching uh, module following the theory outlined here. Uh, so for those of you who are interested in knowing more about how that is done, and this is all Braden's ideas, uh, actually that we've just uh, uh, implemented uh, and what is, uh, what is done and how it is done. It's even provided an Excel uh, template that you can download and uh, uh, do uh, that you can download here where you see how that conversion is actually done in, in practice uh, if you want to test it yourself. 
uh, and that's uh, the conversion that's applied such that the input to the numerical RGA analysis, which was eight FCD, would not be the same as the FCD that you that you uh, uh, necessarily use in history matching because there is a uh, to do that consistently, you need to convert the FCD uh, parameter according to that theory. So everything else is uh, inputted according to uh, the data that was uh, provided. Uh, we see the, uh, I think the FCD in this case is 14, not the eight, so it changes a little bit, but uh, our results in general for being the first run, and here we can tweak things to make it perfect, but to make it be the first run, things looks pretty decent, uh, both in terms of the GORs and OGRs, water cuts is okay if we ignore the early time, and also these other, uh, other plots. Uh, good. So now we have 10 more minutes of the call, uh, and I know there's been a lot of information. I uh, hope I didn't drown all of you in information. Uh, and uh, at this point, I think we're I think we're ready to take some uh, take some uh, questions. Uh, Curtis, any comments from uh, from you uh, in general? Yeah, no, I think uh, we'll just uh, not use time for my comments and see what the questions are. And then maybe in response to some of the questions, I'll have some some comments to those things. Very good. Very good. So, uh, uh, yeah, so I uh, see there's a few uh, questions uh, here. Uh, yeah, so there are some questions about the definition of uh, LFP. Uh, Mo, do you have any questions that are of any? Uh, uh... I guess as you're getting ready for for the questions, I can just make a comment to to from my perspective, the most difficult and let's say uncertain part of traditional RTA work is that of uh, changing flowing bottom up pressures, meaning that you need some form of superposition to handle that. And that's very difficult, particularly when you get into the multi-phase uh, flow that we see almost from the get-go with, with water and then uh, hydrocarbon phase and then two hydrocarbon phases. And what's I think beautiful about this methodology is that the simulator is taking care as accurately as we as we technically can. It, it's using exactly the, the bottom of production history that we believe the well is experienced and forcing that upon uh, the analysis. So you're getting all of this so-called superposition taken care of by the numerical model, as well as all of the complex phase behavior and um, PVT multi-phase um, and relative permeabilities are, are being treated as rigorous as we can uh, with the numerical model. Uh, the alternative in conventional RTA being pseudo this, pseudo that, etc. So I think uh, that's just a comment. Yeah. Uh, very good. Uh, very good, Curtis. Uh, one question that uh, comes up uh, uh, a lot this. Uh, Kind of what what would be some of the key benefits of the method and you mentioned that uh, uh, as well, Curtis. Uh, and I think one of the the most common feedbacks that uh, I get at least when I've now I probably talked to 150 or 200 uh, industry professionals about the workflow is that it's a very easy workflow for them to understand when they read the paper. Uh, as Curtis mentioned, it doesn't require any complex. Uh, call it equations that in many, many, many times uh, scare uh, many of us uh, in terms of uh, pseudo pressure definitions or pseudo time definitions. Uh, we don't have to work in a different uh, time space. We can work in what I call uh, the real world. Um, and the other thing that's very, very nice is that many, many times when I've sent the paper to people, uh, we discussed the workflow. Uh, a lot of Folks have actually just with very simple numerical models been able to replicate and 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 verify the conclusions and the workflow and actually use it on real data in Excel uh, by themselves. A little bit tedious, but they've been able to at least do it once or twice uh, by themselves, which is also a good thing because a lot of engineers uh, in general, uh, you know, like 
to know what they're using, know the limitations and the capabilities of a of a tool, uh, and also you know know that you can do it yourself if you if you want to and understand all the pieces makes you also more more comfortable. The uh, yeah. yeah, there are a couple of questions, Matthias. I don't know if you want to go through those. Uh, yeah, so uh, I see I get a lot of them on the private chat there as well. So I just uh, there's a few ones that. Uh, uh, it's related to, uh, uh, yeah. So do you have an example that you can show us on how the Bowie workflow has helped establish the wells per section needed? So in this uh, slide deck, uh, I don't have that, uh, but uh, I would uh, very, very much encourage you to watch the previous webinar uh, with uh, Braden, where he talks about how uh, they internally are using it for uh, call it well spacing recommendations for future development, uh, et cetera. Uh, so uh, in that sense, it's a very, uh, very efficient workflow, at least in, in my uh, opinion and uh, to my understanding. And, and um, I'm sure Braden would be happy to, to, to comment that as well as, uh, as uh, a method where they aggregate all these parameters to the entire pad and they look not on the individual well level, but they actually look at uh, kind of the composite of all the LFPs and all the OIPs for that particular um, particular uh, pad. Uh, so uh, that's the the go to uh, item that I would uh, answer to that uh, to that question. I also got another uh, interesting question that uh, we actually uh, asked our, ourselves as uh, as well, which was related to uh, uh, if uh, if uh, it's a good question from uh, from uh, Dave up at uh, ARC, if there's any comments on using this technique in situations where you know the fracture sizes within a single stage are unequal. And I think uh, what we call that was uh, at least looking at some cases that had frac heterogeneity such that all the fracs are very different. Uh, and um, I think a lot of that and a lot of these type of questions like the, what the Dave uh, came with here uh, uh, initiated this uh, little research project from from Braden's side, where he created essentially a catalog with all the sensitivities of all these uh, these different uh, aspects that I'm uh, I'm sure he'll be more than happy to 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 share. But if I remember correctly, in that uh, particular case, uh, Dave, you get this uh, kind of situation where you would not only follow one of the one of the type curve uh, uh, stems, but that it will actually cross over different uh call it oip stands uh, with uh, time which is you know one of the things that you will for sure be uh be uh, seeing with uh, with real uh, with real data uh, and i'll i'll just make Braden a panelist just in case he has a few comments uh, here and there and uh, i know it's not planned so i'll uh, see if he <laughs> if he has any comments regarding any of those uh, questions uh, anything else? <laughs> scary. Yeah. Did uh, did I answer correctly all this? I can't remember exactly, but uh, we I remember we had that discussion with, with regards to the with regards to the uh, frac heterogeneity uh, and its impact on the analysis. Yeah, as Matthias said, yeah. uh, we've run some different synthetics through to kind of see like what is different FCDs, what is different if you have those fracs of different lengths in a stage, how do those look? So what are the what's the look of that and there probably are ways you can include that, so be happy to talk offline and send you my catalog and see what you think. Yeah, the catalog. That's a, that's a very good catalog that uh, uh, so sh sh should be made like uh, should be made uh, almost like a paper or like a public document. <laughs> yeah, you know that's uh, that's uh, very good. Uh, uh, yeah, and we also got a question: Is the method applicable to type four? reservoirs so uh, for fractures re fractured reservoirs and um you know that's that's a good uh, question and uh kind of my world uh you know uh, at least hydraulically fractured reservoirs or fractured reservoirs uh, so my answer to that would be clearly uh, yes uh, i don't know if uh, curtis or Braden has any other uh, sense to add to to that question Well, I think that your base model, if you want to look at, let's say, more complicated or exotic uh, 
pictures of what you believe your reservoir looks like if it's naturally fractured. And then on top of that, you got hydraulic fracturing. You, you can use a more complex base model um, instead of this flanger fracture into an acting single, you know, uh, and divide with that model uh, behavior. So, so you can do a lot of things, but I, I think it's uh, uh, a little bit like the FCD that could vary from hydraulic fracture to hydraulic fracture, but you could do a lot of things with this, but you have to be able to, to model that particular understanding of, of the well and the reservoir. One thing I wanted to make a comment before we finish off, uh, Matthias, is that this doesn't preclude your doing traditional RTA work. If you're very happy with an RTA analysis of a well, you bring that in as a starting point here, and then it'll it'll be your litmus test of well. In fact, now we throw all the PVT in there, we throw rail perms in there, we throw all of this varying uh, bottom of pressure history. You take your parameters from conventional RTA, put it into this system, and it'll tell you immediately whether that set of parameters and that analysis gives you a good history match through history. And if not, it'll allow you to make adjustments in order to get that match. So it doesn't preclude using the traditional RTA, but if your traditional RTA is good, then it better reproduce the results of the well performance for gas, oil, and water rates as, as, uh, as it would taking those model RTA uh, numbers to a numerical simulator. This just would automate it and make that process a lot faster. Uh, a couple of, I mean, there's like a ton of questions, a little bit overwhelming, uh, but uh, the uh, good question again, uh, does this workflow add anything to analyzing dry, dry gas plays beyond the traditional RTA workflows? Uh, that's a great question because a lot of the advanced or uh, benefits that we saw was due to these multi-phase effects. That's obviously not, uh, I guess, a problem in dry gas plays or, uh, uh, or wet gas plays for that matter. But uh, uh, I would say one thing that uh, would still add some value there, I think, would be the consistency from the RTA to at least a numerical uh, uh, model that would be kind of like a seamless uh, type of uh, one step uh, process. But uh, except from that, uh, I don't have too much experience with uh, with uh, other potential uh, benefits. I don't know about uh, you, Braden, if you have a couple of cents there. Yeah, I would agree with you. We've used it on dry gas and it works. It's just not as much of an improvement because it's the multi-phase effects are, are gone. So uh, yeah. you can still use it, but yeah, it's not uh, not going to be the same step of improvement. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then uh, there's a question if the board workflow can give any indications that your PVT or relative permeability data is uh, uh, incorrect. Uh, and uh, uh, that's a great question. And I will probably also throw in bottom of pressure uh, data there. Like if you, at least if you've calculated it, uh, that the answer to that is uh, uh, yes. And at least in many cases uh, where we have done the workflow uh, and we see like, okay, maybe we need to actually use a different set of bottom of pressure calculations. And then when we update that, everything falls into place. Uh, same with the PVT. Or the same with uh, with rel perms. I think that you can, in many times, at least I've experienced that uh, with the complex fluids and whatnot, is that you can kind of initialize your reservoirs with a uh, fluid and rel perm. You bring it into kind of the Bowie workflow, and then you see that you know maybe your 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 uh, cume oil and and the Bowie plot makes sense, but that uh, you're not good on the gas. So you would like as many of those kind of type curves to 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 align uh, towards the same OIP. So many times that can be an iterative process where you actually go back and forth a couple of times before you nail it, uh, nail it down. So uh, I would say that uh, doing it automatically, uh, I haven't gotten that far uh, yet, but I definitely think it can indicate if your PVT, rel perms, or bottom of pressure data is uh, incorrect or need uh, needs adjustments. And all of those things are very tightly cop coupled, obviously. Uh, will you agree to that, Braden? Or yep, I would agree. And I'd say we're we're trying to look to see if you have say a whole bunch of wells in the same formation. Can you try to hone in on those PVT 
rail perm properties together. So not just getting a match on one, but can you kind of match them all the best you can? So, uh, but yeah, I agree with the iterative. It can help you kind of hone in on some of those things you might have more uncertainty on. Yeah, very good. And uh, was also some questions about the height that's used in the tool. Um, uh, and uh, in the workflow, you assume that the fractured height is equal to the reservoir height. Uh, but actually, uh, at least in, 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 in our tool, you can actually, uh, at least after the workflow is applied, you can change and you can add uh, contributions above the frac height or beyond the frac tip and make a more complex type of model. And you can even make a EFR model now uh, as well if you if you want to want to do that. How to do that consistently with all the results from the numerical RTA? We're not there yet, but at least you're able to do that if you absolutely uh, absolutely want to. Um, Good. So I see our time is uh, up, and we have so many questions that I uh, I'll start to feel sorry if I don't uh, uh, answer all of them. So I'll try to respect everybody's time and thank everybody for tuning in. And uh, uh, we're obviously always available for questions and whatnot over email, uh, or if we meet at a conference. Urtek is not many months uh, away. Uh, we're happy to talk uh, about this uh, workflow. Uh, any. Time of the year, and also thanks to to Braden for on the on the spot there joining for a few questions. That was very very uh, uh, helpful. And uh, on that note, I'll just uh, thank everybody for listening in, and and uh, we'll just uh, stay in touch.